Good morning and welcome to Rusty Metal Ranch. In part one of my Ray Klontz Clay Spencer tire hammer build, I talked about how I made the anvil and the um, and the ram, also known as the hammer, um, how I had to piece those together uh, in order to uh, be able to even do the project for a lack of finding a solid piece of metal for either one. Uh, today I'd like to go over some of the various uh, bits and pieces that make up the majority of the uh, mechanism of the hammer. Uh, we'll start over here with the uh, link arms. The plans called for black pipe with a uh, half by one uh, solid in between them. I opted to go with uh, one and three eighths inch round bar and then bore the hole out to the one inch to fit the, uh, the oil light bushings. Um, I found it uh, found it a little difficult to find 80, Schedule 80 black pipe here in my area, so uh, this I could come up with pretty easily and it wasn't terribly difficult to do. I don't think it took any more time uh, otherwise. To facilitate building these two pieces identically and perfectly square with one another, I made this jig. It's just a piece of angle iron with two one-inch pieces uh, squared up and tack welded in place. I was able to put the uh, the completed bushings, I'm sorry, the bushing holders, uh, the bushings weren't in yet, over top of these um, and then weld everything together. Once everything was welded, I took it back to the mill. I, um, I was able to uh, grab it in the vise on this cross piece here, the link part, and then uh, remount the holes exactly uh, perpendicular to uh, level and exactly six inches apart. So those are identical pieces and they both work uh, in interchangeably. Next part is the ram guide. Um, I've got the UMHW in there now. I deviated from the plans a little bit where the bottom guide on the plans it called for you to weld some all thread to the side and then have it sticking down below. I opted to make a piece with a female threaded hole that I could use to um, run a bolt head through there and, and screw it in. I felt it was um, a little more secure in that if something happened, uh, something fell on it or something got banged up in there, it might damage the all thread and make it impossible to, um, to get the, the guide off or I have to cut the thing off and read rework it, rebuild it, whatever. Um, it's really hard to damage a female thread when it's inside like that and I felt it might be, uh, besides a lower profile option, um, maybe a little bit more maintenance free in the future. Also, um, I noticed on, I believe it's Fiery Furnace Forge, they make and build tire hammers and this is similar to what they do for their top guide stop. And um, I like that as opposed to just welding on a piece of angle iron with the finger barely sticking in there to hold it in place. Um, with both the top guides and the bottom guides, um, it's a quarter inch bolt, but I drilled out the holes, the 5 sixteenths, to give me a little bit of room to, to monkey it and keep it out of the way. And as you can see, it uh, it moves without any, any real effort. Um, I did use quarter inch thick UMHW or UHMW and um, the reason I did that was because this piece, the ram, was already undersized. Um, so it made sense for me to go ahead and fill up all that space with uh, the UHMW other, rather than a 3 16 piece and a whole bunch of shims. It just seemed simpler. Um, I may add a couple really, really thin shims because I've got some, some play in it, but from what I understand, talking to uh, various members of the Clay Spencer Tire Hammer Group on Facebook, that you don't want, you want some play, you don't want to be like quarter inch sloppy or nothing. I think if I added um, maybe 15, 20 thousandths under each shim, I think I would be probably pushing my luck as far as how tight it needs to be. You do want it to be a little bit loose and have a little bit of side to side clank clank. Um, the spring uh, spring covers or spring caps or spring cups or whatever they're called in the book, 
I opted to make mine one piece. I had some three inch round stock and uh, I felt it was a lot better in trying to dig up the individual parts. I think there's four or five different parts to make up these cups. Um, and some of them were were kind of oddball for my area. I wouldn't be able to find them really easy. So I just made my own. Um, I ended up welding the inside corner to kind of give it a little bit of extra strength, just that little bit of extra. Um, hopefully that uh, prevents any, any damage in the future, although I, I'm not expecting any. The upper arms, I ran into a couple tricks that I want to share. One is take a piece of board, paper, it doesn't matter, cardboard, draw a line on it, and then 22 degrees out, draw a line on either side. And then you can take your, your upper arms, when you're getting ready to weld that nut in place, line them up, and before you split the all thread, keep it one piece, put the nuts on it and then get them lined up up and down and side to side in the in the housing here and then you can tack weld them in place that way you know everything is 22 degrees it's all held in plane with one another so you're not going to have the spring cockeyed or anything like that um, that made it uh, almost trivial to get everything dialed in um, when I had the four side plates I went ahead and lined them all up together and then gang drilled them uh, so everything would be exactly on the same same place um, on both pieces so all I had to do was get the first piece done as close as I could kind of freehand you know I had to kind of place everything out and kind of clamp it together and double check the measurements and all that stuff but when I got that done I was able to put the newer pieces on top of this line it up with the pins through the holes and that way I knew everything was going to be exactly the same as as this one um, with the spring adjuster rods I simply used my uh, hex collet for my 5C on the, on the mill vise, and I just made myself a 5 inch, 5 eighths inch head on both sides so I can use a 5 eighths inch wrench uh, to adjust it. Nothing special here. Um, the plans call for 1 and 5 eighths. I narrowed it down just a touch, whatever the, uh, the bearing would allow me, um, just to take up a little bit of that slop because uh, the, the link ends there, I'm sorry, up there, are inch and a half wide. I didn't want an eighth of an inch of play. I mean, granted, you need some play, but an eighth of an inch seemed a, a little excessive. I know it works um, as the plans are called for. I know it works on other people's hammers. I just, I just didn't see a reason not to do it. It, it didn't seem like it was going to affect anything. And uh, obviously, if uh, it does, I'll have to eat some crow, but I think we're going to be just fine. The pulley is uh, a leftover piece of that three inch from, from the spring cups that I inserted into a piece of a three and a half inch pipe, welded it on the inside, welded on the outside, cleaned it up, and, uh, and got it all ready to go. The uh, shaft is sacrificial. Um, I made it specifically so I could put that in an arbor in the lathe so everything was perfectly concentric and, uh, and so I could get everything cleaned up. Um, I'll, go, I'll come back to that in a little bit for something else. The hub assembly or counterweight assembly, um, nothing too different about this from the plans. Um, if you watch any of Curtis Herman's videos um, and Raymond Head, I believe, they talk about making your hole here inside to fit this machine surface. And uh, while it's not a press fit, it is a very good, easy to move, uh, very little play fit. So uh, that takes some of the pressure off of the studs um, when it's swinging around. Um, I did have to cut a little bit on here to fit my rim as the plans were called for. Um, one thing I did, this also was supposed to be black pipe according to the plans. I just made a bushing. I took some one and a half inch and I bored it out to fit this as a press fit. Um, the, the bolts aren't exactly one inch. It's probably like 0.992 or 991 or something. And uh, it's a little tiny bit undersized. So I simply bored the hole in this to match. So when it came time to put it all together, I, I put the bolt through here. I put uh, this on top of it and I pressed this down um, until it, um, it got tight. 
and then I double checked for square and tack welded it all up. Um, I passed up doing the whole nut on a piece of pipe to tighten everything up because by the time I got this uh, together, there was no play, there was no slop, there was no moving it. Um, it was perfectly square and it just, yeah. I, I didn't have the hardware, I'd have to go to the hardware store. So yeah, call it lazy, but also, uh, you know, kind of uh, I meant to do that. This one, nothing special about this. Uh, the only thing I did different was, the, and this is the, the motor pivot and brake pivot plate, by the way. Uh, the only thing I did different was uh, the plans call for two pieces here that get welded together. I've never had much luck welding two pieces of uh, a plate, quarter inch plate together like that and having it square and flat without doing some extra work. So I just took one piece and cut it out. I just, it was easier for me to do it that way. Um, I didn't have the inch and a quarter angle iron, but I did have some uh, 5 16 inch thick uh, two by two. So I just simply cut the top part to inch and a quarter and the bottom part to uh, one and a half to make it a little bit beefier and then uh, made these blocks to uh, for the pivot points. Um, no, nothing really special there. I'll probably use some, uh, some shoulder bolts to uh, for the pivots when I get to that far. Um, a word of caution, when you're buying your parts, I've seen, you know, big shirt, well, let me back up. When you're buying your parts, make sure you get the right parts. Um, I've seen a few cases where people have built their own tire hammers according to the plans, and they get a little stuck on the, uh, the stub axle here uh, and what they need to get. The plans call for a 1750 rated stub axle. That's 1750 pounds. But what that means is if you have two of them on an axle, that whole axle is rated for 3,500 pounds. Um, a lot of people get confused because sometimes when you're looking, especially if it's on Amazon and the sellers are, you know, from a different country, they'll tell you it's a 1,750 pound axle and these people will think that the stub shaft is rated that much when it's rated half of that. So when you're looking, make sure you get the stub shaft for a 3,500 pound axle, which makes this rated 1750. And for further clarification, those are the dimensions on the outer and inner bearings. So if you have those dimensions, you probably have the right axle. Um, a, couple, a couple things to note. I mentioned in the first video that the uh, instructions can be a little confusing and they're kind of helter-skelter a tiny bit, you know, in different places. You got uh, this piece is like at the front of the book and putting this together is in the middle and this other part is in the back and it's supposed to kind of be all together but but it doesn't quite flow that way uh, that's what I meant when I said you the information is there you just have to kind of read through and make sure you understand what's what and which pieces go where because um, when I started doing this I was getting a little confused by uh, some of the placements of the holes um, and how it all lays out and I had to kind of go back and forth between a couple I think two or three different pages to kind of get it all dialed in my head so I had a better idea of what I was trying to do and even then I had to kind of stop and look at some pictures to make sure I understand how the whole thing went together so um, again the instructions have all the information you need you're just going to have to make sure you spend some time um, paying attention to them so you understand how it all goes together the last part I'd like to talk about is the hub spacer. On the rims, you'll see that the, the lug seat and the near lip uh, stand out further than the uh, flat surface here. So when you go to put the hub in, that flange won't sit completely flat all the way down, and nor will it even come close to hitting the uh, top of the, the lug seats because of the lip. Um, and if you were tighten, if you were to put it together and you tighten this side first, then you tighten up these, it'll cant this way first, and then it'll try to pull it back down when you tighten these up. And that's a really good recipe to break something if you overdo it. And even if you don't break it in the assembly, you can uh, you can get it kind of cockeyed just a little bit and not really notice, and then the hammering action can kind of cause some damage as well. So. That's what this is all about. 
Now they've, in the instructions, they talk about using washers to shim up and everything. Um, but I also think uh, you've seen discussions where, uh, you know, washers aren't exactly consistent sizes and then you got slightly different weights and all that. Is it out of balance and so on? I, I don't think the balance matters quite as much, but the, the thickness will matter. So if you make it out of one piece, you're, you're golden. You're not going to have those issues and everything's going to be... Uh, be basically one contiguous piece without any issues. So, uh, moving on and to close, I would like to kind of talk about, talk to those who are considering building the tire hammer and watching this video and other videos, trying to decide if you want to take on the project. Um, my, my first enthusiastic reaction is going to be absolutely. This project is amazing. Um, having a blast. Um, the instructions have made it uh, really easy to, uh, to make one part at a time and just kind of go down the list and knock things off. But as you're watching videos and you're watching these builds, you're probably hearing things like milling machine and, and digital readouts and, and lathe and... Uh, even simple things like, you know, putting a keyway slot in the pulley and you're wondering how the heck am I going to do that without, you know, the right tools. Um, the instructions are set up for really basic construction with a pretty modest set of tools. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need a milling machine to uh, to cut the ends off of this. You just use a, an angle grinder and make sure it's square. Um, you don't need to make uh, the spring ends out of one piece on a lathe. You can use the, uh, the given instructions and the parts they call for and, and weld up your own pieces. I guess what I'm saying is don't let, don't let uh, not having availability of certain tools cause any grief. It, it may take you a little bit longer to make something as opposed to someone who has the right tools but you also have to remember um, at least in my case I've actually spent more time by you know having to make these eyes instead of actually uh, using some black pipe um, things like that it's uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword so don't be worried about not having the tools uh, you may have to beg borrow or bribe uh, somebody, you know, a friend of yours, give them a six pack of beer or whatever to do the keyway slot, uh, maybe even pay a machine shop or even, uh, even buy one from Curtis Herman or, uh, Raymond Head. They have those things available if you don't have the means to make it. Um, and even things like, uh, installing the, uh, the lugs on this, uh, on the counterweight. I did it with a digital readout. I have that luxury, but it can be done by hand. I've done it by hand. It's not terribly difficult if you are uh, meticulous and you spend the time being sure and double-checking yourself. So, anyways, um, I'm going to say yes. If you're thinking about it, by all means, go for it. It's absolutely worth it. I'm having a blast. I'm really, really enjoying this project. So, with that, have a good one, and we will see you when, uh, when the frame's ready.